today's Industry Week webcast, The Blueprint for Smart Manufacturing, Balancing Citizen Development and Governance, sponsored by Tulip Interfaces. My name is Robert Schoenberger, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Industry Week. I would now like to welcome today's speakers. Natan Linder is co-founder and CEO of Tulip Interfaces, the leading frontline operations platform reimagining MES and operational technology, and he's co-founder and chairman of Forum Labs. He holds a PhD from MIT Media Labs Fluid Interfaces Group and has a depth of expertise in computer science, product design, and entrepreneurship. Eric Morandet leads product and ecosystem at Tulip with more than 15 years experience building the leading teams in customer service, operations, and product development. With that, let's get started. Eric, the floor is yours. Thanks, Robert. It's good to be here. Um, all right. Well, I want to start by introducing some of the key themes that we're going to be covering in today's webinar. As the, the title implies, today is going to be focused on how do you both embrace citizen development uh, and really empower that frontline worker to solve the problems that they're facing every day, but then balance that with the requirements for governance and process control. And so we've broken this topic up into three main themes here. The first is the emergence of citizen development. What is this? Why is it happening? And what does it mean? The second is how do companies think about making the shift to a citizen development mindset, culture, and affect that reality? And the third is the citizen development at scale. How do you go from a couple of proof points or a successful pilot to actually changing the way your organization works at scale uh, by really empowering the citizen developer? So with that, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hand it off to Nathan, who is going to cover uh, the first theme here, uh, the emergence of citizen development. So Nathan, you want to take us away? Yeah, excellent and great to be here as well. Um, I'm going to kind of start from the end. So... The world is already living in a citizen development reality. Uh, it's just may not be as distributed as uh, one may think, especially in operations. Uh, the main reason this is happening is because we simply do not have enough software development on the planet, developers on the planet, uh, to support what you need to do, uh, what software needs to be built, uh, and by what times and to what business needs. And that, that's a general statement. In fact, uh, you know, no code and low code uh, is nothing new. We had it for many, many years. This is just uh, the more uh, common and uh, um, well understood name we've been using the past few years. Um, but, uh, you know, ERP systems, uh, business process modeling, CRMs, had numerous examples where you had workflows uh, using simple configuration, including logic, uh, that allows you to, to do uh, uh, basic application development. And uh, it's been around for a very long time, uh, typically controlled uh, by IT folks uh, or uh, empowering business users. Now, what's happening now is that uh, we're sort of going through a renaissance because technology has improved dramatically and the web and the cloud as infrastructure de facto become our back end and our front end uh, for anything software development. And uh, we should look closely into that. And what you're actually seeing is uh, uh, wh where it comes into play. It's, a, it's in fact a democratization movement where you see a lot of different business users uh, coming in and adopting tools that are very, very specific that allows certain type of users to accomplish certain types of tasks. So this could be building applications for e-commerce on platforms like Shopify or, you know, having uh, internal tools built on a platform like Retool. And when you look at this slide and you see all those uh, different logos, you, you might ask yourself, like, how does that move uh, forward uh, to the, the shop floor? So I, I want to kind of double down on that. This is kind of the simple uh thesis uh, we're seeing. So if designers, for example, adopt Figma to build interactive prototype because it's faster and better uh, for them to create uh, a workflow that brings designs to devel developers and developers can move faster, they're, they're not going back. If web developers adopt tools like Webflow uh, uh, instead of classic uh, well-adopted CMSs like WordPress, the reason they do it is because they can get control and creating dynamic websites faster. And, and you collect those examples, the reality is it's becoming internal, in, integral part of, of what is a common tech stack to get a job done fast to spec and be agile uh, when the business needs is changing. Uh, that, that is in fact reality also in operations. So if you ask Gartner, they would tell you that uh, 
by 2023, 80% of organization will adopt uh, this composable approach to building application and start implementing it, including in uh, systems like MES and other industrial operation software. Uh, and 70% will use low code or no code uh, and already have uh, in fact started and upticking quite steadily since uh, uh, 2020 or so. And the, the real question that I'm interested in, especially, you know, with the tool perspective, but also, you know, talking to a lot of our partners and customers is like, what, what is actually driving this? And so if we examine what's really driving this, there's three main things that are happening. One is we can agree that our IT and OT stacks have been virtualized. So we have multiple solution hosted in cloud environments that uh, allow you to scale infinitely uh, with compute, storage, and the like. Uh, to build your applications. And then the foundations or, or the tools we actually use to do that, whether it's uh, uh, the actual services coming from whatever cloud infrastructure vendor you're using or, um, you know, and this could be a, something as simple as storage or a machine learning service or uh, a connectivity stack uh, or what have you, those have become very, very accessible. The cost curve have dramatically dropped it makes it easier to put it at the hands of people and, and quickly try try things out uh, in in a real operational environment like your shop floor or your machine shop and, and quickly get something up and running and test it. So no longer you need to commit to a very long, complex um, RFP-driven type of uh, uh, prototyping uh, environment. Um, the last point I'll make here, uh, there's clearly a generational shift. Uh, the workforce uh, that we're seeing coming in now uh, was born uh, with the internet and specifically mobile phones. They think mobile first and they think data first. And th these workers uh, come with new skills and demand new types of interfaces, especially in frontline operations. And the engineers serving uh, both the operators and the people running operations need um, to, to deal with this workforce with, with a language uh, that they understand and they can comfortably um, adopt uh, at scale uh, to build a better uh, operation. Uh, otherwise, they're not getting workforce uh, or not getting the workforce that they need uh, to stay competitive. And so with that, you know, and, and before I move it on to Eric, I want to leave you with a little bit of a provocative thought that, you know, citizen development is not a fad. It's in fact something that is happening and it's an imperative. Eric, over to you. Thanks, Nathan. So, we heard a little bit about why is this happening, what's changing, uh, you know, how is reality changing such that this is becoming increasingly a norm across all verticals. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about, you know, as a part of a large organization who's trying to affect, you know, empower the frontline workers, uh, harvest the good ideas and the pockets of innovation that exist within those, uh, from those folks who know their process the best and who's, who are, who's solving these problems day to day, one way or the other. I want to talk a little bit about you know, how do you actually shift to a citizen development culture? Uh, and there's two parts to this. The first is empowerment. And then the second is uh, gar uh, governance, putting guardrails in place, making sure that uh, you do maintain some semblance of control, particularly over critical systems and critical processes. So first, I want to cover a couple of different points of view that exist within the typical enterprise. Um, you know, we work, we've worked with folks uh, who have been on this journey for a, a you know, number of years now. And, you know, if I were to summarize the key perspectives here, you know, you have your executive perspective, the operations or in the engineering folks, IT and quality. And I mean, at the end of the day, at the executive level, what do I care about? You know, I want to understand how is this going to impact my bottom line? How am I going to get more, uh, like decrease my inefficiencies, decrease my cost while outputting more? I've got increasingly aggressive targets to hit. I'm facing an increasingly competitive environment. So how is this going to impact my bottom line? As an engineer uh, on the operations team, I mean, look, these guys, they know the problems that they want to solve. And a lot of times they know how to solve the problems. They just need to be, you know, they're just like, get out of my way. Just give me the tools. Right. So for them, it's like, why are we moving so slow? You know, how, how can I, how can I be faster? Now, if you're an IT coming to this from the IT perspective, 
you know, a lot of times you're wondering, you know, this is great. I would love to give everyone everything they ask for, but they have no idea what they're actually asking for. There are security implement, implement, uh, implications. There are critical systems of record that need to uh, be audited. And, you know, uh, maintaining control over these systems and these processes is critically important. And now if you're a quality person coming to the, uh, to the party here, uh, what do you care about? Particularly if you're operating in a regulated environment, look at, you can veto anything. If it jeopardizes the quality of the product, think something like a vaccine uh, that has really the ability to impact someone's uh, someone's life in a very profound way, right? So quality is paramount, and the idea of unbounded citizen development can be quite can be quite terrifying, and, and justly so. So we're going to talk about this tension a little bit. Now, if I were to summarize it, you know, distill this down into two competing uh, different perspectives here. You know, we've basically got the control side. I need to control everything, and the get out of my way. I want to solve problems. This also. Uh, is our, our, this is, how we're meeting our quota for clip art. So we know in webinars, you need at least one piece of clip art. This is our, our clip art here. So we've got, you know, uh, we may have more, I don't know, but that's, uh, you know, I think, I think that's important as well. Well, back to the, the, the main theme here, you know, no, there are th that the clip arts actually represent, uh, the shifts between kind of the old world and the new world, right? Like we used to make fun of clip arts in the nineties on that. This is sort of, you know, IT versus XYZ or OT versus XYZ, but this is this is really what's going on. So you should you should really explain that to our audience here. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, so look, it boils down into two competing perspectives. The I need to control, and I'm going to be a little bit uh, you know, reductio ad absurdum here, but I'm going to be. Uh, uh, I need to control everything. Nothing happens unless it's approved and been completely, uh, you know, gone through the process and has been signed off by everybody because, you know, we need to have strict control over everything that happens within the operation. And then you have often that perspective is detached from the actual challenges of the operation for real. And then you have the other perspective, which is the engineers who's like, look, I know how to solve these problems. I grew up on using these tools in my day-to-day -day life and I know what to do. Just get out of my way. Give me the tools. Right. And so this is the main uh, conflict that is going to frame the rest of the discussion uh, today. Um, so first, a couple of things. What uh, Governance. Our take on governance is first, it's critical. You have to have it. You can't produce something like a vaccine that's going to, you know, uh, like materially and permanently impact someone's immune system without proper governance. Uh, but we would say governance can be best achieved if approached at the platform level, not at the individual application level. In fact, there's, it's a little bit paradoxical here, but if you think about providing the right set of controls on a singular platform, as opposed to rigid, rigidly controlled point solutions that are all stitched together, you actually end up with better visibility and better control over the process as a whole. And as you'll see, that doesn't have to come at the cost of citizen development and empowering those frontline users. The two can be reconciled. Now, when we talk about governments, what are we actually talking about here? There's a couple of different specific things we're talking about. The first, what are the data structures? When these, you know, when processes are run, what data is being captured, work orders, serial numbers, lot numbers, perhaps test outputs, and then where is this being populated into a backend data structure? You need to have some control over that. Second, if you're deploying uh, software to help facilitate the execution of a process, you need to have lifecycle management around that software. And what I mean by that is if you're going to, you know, let's take as an example, an app that's guiding someone through a complex uh, manual process of some sort, regardless of what they're making, you need to have the ability to say, look, this has been reviewed, it's been approved, and it's now authorized to be deployed into production to impact how people are actually accomplishing this process. And then the last are workforce capabilities. You know, some of our customers have incredibly high turnover within their operations, and you want to make sure that the person is trained to operate the piece of equipment or they're trained to execute the process that they're about to go to work on. And so there's some controls um, that are required around that as well. Now, to make things even, you know, to drive the point home here, I've mentioned it a couple of times. You know, this is everything we've discussed thus far is important really regardless of what industry you're in. Nobody's going to, uh, you know, run any process uh, with any degree of uh, effectiveness 
uh, without some control and some semblance of here's how we need to do business. But this is all the more important when you're talking about a CFR 21 Part 11 compliant environment where you're making something like a COVID-19 vaccine uh, where you the FDA could rightly come into your facility and audit you at any moment. And if you don't have the proper ducks in a row and the proper governance in place and the appropriate audit trail, then you know, this is more than just saying, oh, well, we lost a couple of basis, basis points on our bottom line. This is like, all right, great. Everyone turn the lights off and leave because this facility is being shut down. So this is like critically important stuff that we're talking about. For this next part, Natan, I want to hand it back off to you and love to hear your thoughts on citizen development versus the convergence of IT and uh, OT. Great. Thanks, Eric. So the first, the first thing we want to share is sort of how we see the world where um, platforms that enable citizen development and um, no-code, low-code development emerge and become a viable uh, way to solve problems on the shop floor. And the reason we like this uh, diagram because it, it shows uh, how use cases span uh, multiple uh, various verticals. You know, discrete manufacturing, you know, we, we can see customers uh, in automotive or in luxury goods uh, right next to life science customers. And guess what? All of them need uh, OEE and uh, maybe a 5S application or data collection, uh, uh, production visibility and the like. And uh, these use cases are typically, uh, you know, supported uh, by by templates and by uh, reusable content. And th this is really, you know, if you build on onto this and, and how we think, what you know, what enables this, is understanding that, uh, in fact, this is already reality because any, and, and, and we'll talk about the um, what's missing in the middle of this uh, uh, chart in a second, but anywhere we, we spend our time, uh, operational environment, be, the, be it labs or machine shop, shop floors, uh, warehouses, uh, there's always some sort of an existing state of an IT and OT stack um, with the various, you know, suspects, usual suspects, WMS, MES, and the like, everyone has invested into uh, uh, porting uh, or adopting cloud-based infrastructure, um, and everybody has some some degree of automation um, machines or automated setups driven by PLCs and the like. And to bridge the gap between your physical environment, your infrastructure, and building apps quickly by a citizen development motion, there's one thing missing, which is like a viable and active ecosystem and community. Um, and that's, that's, that's what we're seeing enabling uh, the, main, uh, uh, the main motion that we would like to share what, what we've learned today. And if you want a different way to look at it on the next slide, uh, what, what I wanna share is what does it look like from the sea level um, and, and I think we can agree that uh, organizations have started shifting from you know, traditional, uh, very hierarchical and functional driven organization that use top down control and try and like dictate every process uh, to a reality where we're using best of breed stack of tools, uh, upskilling people, giving them ability to not only uh, understand data, but uh, define what data needs they have and through various tools, uh, no code, low code and others like BI and various others uh, types of tools that exist, uh, uh, basically exercise what we call emergent control uh, uh, through, uh, through governance techniques, but also through the ability to have the people who do the work actually impact the work. And this is in turn becomes human centric. And when, 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 when you put it all together, and this is maybe like a second before you actually embark on a journey like that, and and, and these are the couple examples I want to share uh, that come from uh, this uh, you know very engineering heavy world of you know next generation platform architectures. I know this is a big topic for a lot of CIOs and IT folks who are potentially with us today on the call, um, but these architectures are are actually uh, changing dramatically. A couple of examples of where we see IT and OT architectures uh, come together. And in every every customer we visit uh, that started this journey, what, what you're seeing is basically what happened the past 20 years in IT, where, where 
you're not selecting one set of solutions anymore. You're actually building a best of breed system that would solve for your business needs. So in this example, you can see an organization that uses uh, Oracle as a system of record to collect all the master uh, 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 build records, the routes, uh, work orders and the like. Uh, they would use Blue Yonder to do supply chain and they would start building down and you see where the frontline operation uh, platform comes in uh, to, to enable various apps as you go down the stack and actually go through connectivity, in this case, through Kepware. So this is, this is just an example. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see a different example from uh, a life science customer where, again, uh, completely different architecture. In this case, there's um, um, uh, not, not only an Oracle ERP, but on the IT side, the service now and an AWS data lake combined with the Viva QMS and a bunch of frontline applications uh, run by Tulip um, uh, supporting various uh, uh, use cases that kind of uh, uh, coexist between the, uh, the, the op side and, and the IT side. So this, this gives you a little bit of a hint of like not, not only these architecture are emerging and being built today, they are reality and they're coming up to scale. And uh, th those are, I wouldn't go as far as like reference architectures that are emerging and you can replicate. And this is due to the heterogeneous nature of the business we're all in because almost no operation is the same, but there's certainly common traits that can help us learn uh, uh, from uh, one, one factory to the other and, and have those architecture, ar architecture emerge much like we're thinking through architecture when we're building a multi-tenant service on on, on the internet today to support any business goal um, should not be different in operations. Um, so I think this is good good infrastructure uh, to get back to Eric, who's spent many years helping uh, evolve such culture and making this a reality. And he can share a little bit what we've learned uh, from organization who went through this transformation. Yeah, if you're a small, medium-sized business, you can do this very quickly with just a few decision makers. If you're, uh, and we work with many such companies, if you're a large Fortune 500 Global 2000 type organization, look, this is a little bit bigger lift. It takes a little more time. And we've also partnered and done this with, I don't know, hundreds uh, at this point uh, of such organizations. So we do have a perspective on the matter, um, but let's talk a little bit about how we actually do that. How do you make the shift? And what does that look like from a culture perspective and uh, when it's actually implemented? And so the first thing that I want to talk about here is, um, you know, when you when you talk about when you talk about implementing citizen development, and we're going to talk about the role of a center of excellence here in, in a moment. Um, you typically you, you sort of see uh, these things exist on a on a spectrum. On the one hand, you have a, a complete decentralization of efforts where everyone is given the ability to solve their own problems. There's no central structure. Um, and honestly, there are some environments in which maybe that's a, an effective approach to the problem, right? There are, is also the, uh, the other extreme. And this is typically what, um, you know, if you think about what the last 20, 30 years of uh, rolling out MES systems have looked like and ERP rollouts, it has been much more to the right of this, uh, of this pendulum swing where it is like highly centralized. You define all of the requirements a priori. You go into it with a specific notion of exactly what that system is going to do once it's implemented. By the way, you're always wrong because the nature of these complex dynamic systems are that one, they're complex. No one person knows exactly what's happening across the whole of the system at any given point in time. And two, they're dynamic. So they change. Product A sells and product B doesn't, right? So, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, there are times in which a more centralized approach makes sense and a more decentralized approach makes sense. Both approaches uh, have problems. What we typically see is that a more balanced approach, what we refer to as a democratized approach, uh, typically works most effectively for our customers. So let's talk a little bit about what the reality on the environment looks like, whether you're centralized or decentralized, you know, wherever you fall on this spectrum. I mean, here's the reality. Uh, you see an operation like this, and this is a picture of a, of a TULIP imp implementation. This is on uh, uh, the DMG Mori uh, spindle assembly line in a facility in France in Germany. Uh, DMG Mori makes large, uh, you know, beautiful uh, metal cutting tools. Um, this is sort of the, the, the core of that operation. The spindle assembly is the big piece of metal that spins, you know, incredibly fast in the center of that driving all operation of the machine. Critical that they get this process right. But let's Think for a moment about 
like what actually happens on this line. And as you can see, this isn't stock imagery. I told you we got our one clip art out of the way. This is a, an actual tulip implementation here. So all of the um, screens that are in front of the operators are saying, you know, on that station, when you're performing this action, what tools do you need to use? What, perf what checks do you need to do to maintain uh, quality throughout the line? You know, take a caliper measurement and, and capture that measurement in real time and make sure that it's being reflected on the history record of that particular spindle. Um, you know, perform a complex operation. You know, you may do this day in and day out, but there might be several steps. They may, you know, you can pull up drawings and get very granular uh, instructions as reference material when you're going through this operation if you're, un if you're unsure of what to do. If you're not certified to do this, you can't even log into these stations. Now, once this operation is running, they have a target that they're trying to hit, and they can say on that dashboard in the background, you know, how am I performing relative to target on a daily basis, on an hourly scorecard basis, Many of these things are, these are things that the operations professionals need to be able to do their job, to be able to manage their outfit. Uh, these aren't things for the most part that IT necessarily cares about or the ERP necessarily cares about. The ERP doesn't care if it took 25 seconds or 15 seconds. It doesn't care if, you know, um, you know, if we're saving some efficiencies here and there, it doesn't care if your hourly output is a little bit below target uh, one hour and then you respond to it in real time. These aren't, these aren't the kind of data that these, that these existing systems of record are interested in, in capturing. These are the kind of data that the operations professionals need to be able to run their line. Now, if we look at the other type of data that's being captured in the same in, on the same line, guess what? You, you know you have a work order that's associated with that uh, with that particular spindle because it's going to a specific customer and it was ordered on a certain date and needs to be fulfilled by a certain date because we need to manage those customers' expectations. You also need to be able to track your uh, your levels of inventory. What are you know when do we need to resupply uh, certain components? Um, you know, what, what's the status of an open work order that the customer is calling and asking for day in and day out? You know, if I make uh, a deviation to the process, let's assume this is taking place in a regulated aerospace and defense uh, environment or a life sciences environment. Guess what? The whole line stops. You can't you can't keep going until you resolve that deviation. You can't release that product until QA comes in and says, yep, I've reviewed the deviation and I'm releasing this to to uh, to be either re released or uh, you know, discarded. So my point here is the, the reality is the centralized approach or the decentralized approach, neither one is sufficient. The reality is that there, each of these competing perspectives, you know, give me the tools and get out of my way, wait, wait, slow down, I need to control all of these things. There's merit in each of these perspectives and you see each of these pers perspectives come into collision in the reality of the shop floor. Uh, and, and you know, this is some of the stuff that we're talking about here. Um, so let's talk for a minute about how do you start to resolve this conflict and, and, and how do you start to uh, empower your citizen developers without, without compromising governance and quality. And the, uh, the role, what we've seen be very effective uh, and what we've recommended for a, a long time and partnered with our, our customers to help them stand up are establishing a center of excellence. And the center of excellence Sometimes, you know, if you think about that pendulum, it, it you know sort of goes back and forth. It exists in a, a you know, either on the decentralized or centralized. But really, if we think about a, the 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 role of a center of excellence and what you know, what is it? What is it? What is its purpose really? It really boils down to two things, and it's it's bidirectional. It's not to control everything. It's really to understand when and where the right guardrails need to be put in place and what proper controls are necessary across which processes to, to drive compliance and to drive governance on those critical processes. But it's also to capture those best practices when they come up, because again, the people who are closest to the operation, they know where the problems are. They know how to solve these problems most effectively oftentimes. And when you do have a pocket of innovation uh, that's, that's solving a problem that is universally applicable in a little bit better way, the center of excellence is also where that where they capture that best practice and disseminate that and make that available to the to the uh, to the other facilities. Okay, so um, let's talk about a little bit from the product side. What does this look like in practice? So you know we haven't talked much about Tulip's role so far. Uh, and this webinar is not intended to focus on on specifically on Tulip, but more broadly on this issue. That said. 
uh, when we're impl- when when customers are adopting citizen development and governance, there are certain features and capabilities that need to exist within that the the platform that you're that you're going forward with. Uh, and you know, uh, Tulip obviously has a perspective on this, so I'm going to share some of the things that are important um, when you're dro- from the citizen developer, and then also from the governance perspective. Uh, again, with the focus on reconciling these two. Um, so the first, what does a citizen developer really need? Uh, well, the first thing they really need oftentimes is the ability to very quickly and easily uh, build build modular units of software. We call them and we think of them in terms of applications in response to very specific problems that they're facing. Uh, so what you're seeing here in the in this screenshot uh, is a. Uh, 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 Tulip's no-code app editor. So, you know, it's modeled after visual presentation software. You can see all the various uh, screens and steps that you can interact with over on the left. You can see all the visual elements up on the right. You can see all the formatting and all the logic handled over on 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 uh, on the right there. Um, the idea here is that you might be, uh, you're, you're, you know your operation inside and out. You know the problems that need to be solved. You know how to solve them but you may not have a computer science degree, right? And you shouldn't need one. The idea here is that you can democratize the ability to, to build modular units of software in response to very specific challenges that your, that your team is facing. So that's the first point. The second point is, as I mentioned, the performance tracking. These applications, you know, they, they, you know, they, 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 they solve specific problems. They can connect to the physical sensors, devices uh, that are in the operation. They can also connect to uh, existing backend infrastructure, which we'll get into in just a little bit more here. But once you have these applications develop and deployed across the line, like the picture we saw a couple of slides ago, uh, you start to immediately uh, produce data that gives you the, pers- the gives you visibility real time into what's happening on the shop floor. And furthermore, that's that it gives you the ability to provide a feedback loop to the people who are actually running that operation, whose behavior influences whether or not you're going to succeed or fail on that day, whether you're going to win or lose. Uh, and so, you know, once you have these applications implemented by the folks who are closest to the problem and you're starting to capture this information, then you can start to build feedback loops in. And what we see time and time again is, you know, people want to do a good job. Uh, and if you tell them what the target, and if they see what the target is and they see what performance is relative to target, you know, that they're going to do a good job. So providing that feedback loop is, is critically important, something we see time and time again from the folks on the, on the floor. Now, a lot of times you might have a sense of the problem that you're facing, but maybe you don't have a clear idea of exactly how you should build uh, an application or what the mental model should be to take on a specific Demba Walk audit or a 5S application or, or something like this. And so we try and make it really easy for you. We get started with a set of best practices. If you go to our website, tulip.co, you can go to the library and you can see over 100 uh, pieces of content here that are all tried and true based in a set of best practices that have emerged from our customer base addressing these issues over, you know, over the past few years here. So uh, the idea here is to lower the barrier to value. We want to be able to, you click a button, you can get these best practices up and running with minor configuration. Uh, you can get these deployed and creating value very quickly. Yeah, so you don't need to build from a blank canvas. Uh, and then last, certainly not least, on um, the citizen development theme is, you know, f- this is a new thing. We People are, cu- you know, uh, folks who are entering the workforce now or who have, you know, everyone has a smartphone in their pocket. Everybody is comfortable managing their day-to-day lives, uh, you know, via these mediums. You know, I do all my banking online. I do all of my messaging online, you know. Um, so people know how to use these tools. Uh, but we're, it's being applied for the first time in a new context, and there is a learning curve associated with that. And so, you know, what we also have at Tulip here is what we call Tulip University. This is a set of uh, uh, of self serve. Uh, it's a self serve curriculum, a set of modules that allow you to go from zero to uh, you know as deep as you would like to go uh, on a specific use case or as general certification. So you can come in here if you have a specific problem, you can take a module, uh, you can learn how to solve that problem, how that's been addressed in the past, you can get started with some templates out of the library, and you can do this very, very quickly. Um, something we saw absolutely take off during COVID uh, and create a lot of value for our customers. Also really important to note that some of our biggest users of Tulip University are citizen developers that are being sponsored through the center of excellence within large enterprise uh, accounts. So 
you know, they'll, they'll onboard cohorts when they go to a new site. Uh, they'll make good use of this resource as they're, as they're uh, equipping their citizen developers. Um, okay, so on the, government, on the governance side, that's great. Everyone can build whatever they want to solve their problems. That sounds maybe a bit terrifying, um, but don't worry. It's, it's, it's okay. We've got, uh, we've got controls in place for that. So a couple, and we're not going to touch on all of these capabilities, but a couple of critical things that are worth mentioning. The first is, uh, you know, simple version control. So when you build an app, you know, when, when an application has been developed, uh, you want to track what rev of the application is there, and you want to have a history of what parts were produced at what time, who was logged in, and what rev of the application was there at that time. So strict versioning control across all of the applications, tables, connectors, and other assets uh, within Tulip is critically important for governance and something that's supported natively within the platform. Next is, in addition to versioning, you want to be able to manage who has permission to approve what. So, you know, this is a very simple process. We only have the production manager and quality, if you can read the text on the screen here. Um, but you, this could be as many different roles as necessary. You could have production manager, you could have quality, you could have, um, you know, as many folks as you need here to make sure that it's going through the right approval process that is specific to your operation and the needs that you face to make sure that anything that does see production has gone through and, and received the, appro the appropriate sign-offs. Now, uh, we have version controlling on the applications. I also want to mention that it's critically important to have version control uh, over what applications are deployed to the physical environment. So, so far what we've talked about is how do you develop these applications and then, and then how are they approved? But then there's also another layer of control that says what, what physical workspaces on the shop floor have access to which applications and which version of the applications should they be running, something that is centrally administered and controlled within Tulip. Again, this is variable. Maybe you're a small shop and you know you would leave this to the engineers who are responsible for that operation. Maybe you're producing the COVID-19 vaccine and this is actually really important. You want to have centralized control over uh, the whole of the production environment on certain lines or something like this. But those, uh, those are supported natively within, uh, within the platform. And then last but not least, much of what we've talked about uh, thus far has been about developing applications and deploying them to the shop floor. Uh, what I want to, what I also want to mention here is that Tulip uh, from day one philosophically has been, has been built with an open architecture in mind. The idea here is that this is a big problem to solve and we don't have any delusions of being the only show in town. We recognize and respect and appreciate that there are a lot of systems that do that perform critical functions within the enterprise. Uh, and Tulip's approach is not to necessarily replace these systems. Sometimes that makes sense, oftentimes it doesn't, but rather Tulip's approach is to integrate with these systems, to share data bi-directionally in a frictionless way, uh, and to, you know, if, if the system you have, let's say SAP is your ERP, if it's doing the job, great, you should use that system to do the job. And when it makes sense to pull that, uh, that master data into Tulip for uh, the purpose of process execution, we make it really easy to be able to do that. And you'll also notice if you think about the difference between this UI and this UI, this was designed with your frontline operations engineer in mind. This is designed much more for an IT stakeholder, somebody who's likely going to be managing the, the, the handshake between the Tulip system and whatever existing digital infrastructure you have in place. That's the last point for me on, on the governance needs as it relates to specific capabilities in the platform. Uh, Natan, if you don't mind, I'm going to hand it off to you and you can talk to us a little bit about citizen development um, at scale and how we're seeing people take this journey. Thanks, okay. Eric. Um, look, doing this for a few years um, as a startup and, and now uh, growing uh, with customers that uh, through interaction we learn from, uh, I want to show you on the next slide uh, some methodolo methodology we've developed to, to build um, uh, a, a COE. But, you know, before, before we dive into that real quick and kind of building on what Eric's just shared, um, this, if, if you think about where we started and uh, in, in the state of no code in, in the industry, uh, you could appreciate that uh, the specificity is important. You know, what, are, what operation needs engineers and operators and their managers and their C-level executive that underwrite uh, programs like that is very, very specific. And, and this, is, this is exactly where, you know, 
the, the experience we're trying to share and the call to action to provide uh, input to this ecosystem would actually make it better because the no code that uh, someone uh, creating application for banking uh, over ERP system XYZ is completely different than folks trying to implement uh, a digital lean program uh, in some uh, tier one um, a supplier to automotive in Michigan. They couldn't be more different. And like, we have to appreciate that. And it spans sizes of organizations and, and what they're actually focused on building um, in their operation. So with that, let, let's look at this and, and, and understand the journey. So real quick, um, you, you may ask yourself, we don't know where to start. I want to give you a very, very specific roadmap. First, uh, pick sites, um, sites that you know you have uh, both real uh, clear pain points that you're trying to solve. It could be quality, it could be training, it could be throughput yields. Um, and identify those sites where you have real champions that uh, you know want, want to improve uh, bottom up, but with the support of, of um, the leadership. And sometimes this was called uh, uh, the lighthouse approach. Well, we, we like to think about it like a greenhouse. We think it's a much better metaphor because in a greenhouse you have a sort of a controlled environment and you can run a lot of tests and you know grow some lettuce grow some tomatoes grow some cucumbers these are just like uh, metaphors to what problems you may solve and in, in, in how you adjust the the right uh, conditions uh, uh, to get to something that you can uh, grow and scale and as you know greenhouses scale pretty nicely lighthouses are are nice if you want to invest in something uh, and to show the art of the possible, but I don't think uh, in in the distributed and complex nature of operations nowadays, uh, it's a metaphor that should hold. So please focus on one and two, which is finding greenhouses that are well supported by good gardeners. Uh, once you have that, you you basically need to work through use cases that uh, create a huge impact uh, on on your organization. Uh, they can also map through your network. This is especially true in organizations that have uh, multiple sites. Uh, certainly, global companies uh, operate uh, in such a way. And moving moving the knowledge from site to site is always a pain, especially as you solidify learning. Once you do that, uh, you can move to stage four and five when uh, you actually expand within this frame, this framework. Uh, and, and if this is done correctly, what you'll find is through this process, uh, the early uh, folks that uh, start adopting these types of techniques and tools and frameworks uh, become the trainers uh, for the next sets of training. So we're seeing uh, customers that uh, in the order of uh, three to six months have literally hundreds of people who have been trained by uh, the first dozen people and they do it online and then they rinse and repeat uh, the process between three and five continuously and they do it in terms that uh, or kind of going full circle and, you know I'm coming to this through my software engineering lens uh, and and the many years I spend uh, we, we've been trained uh, to stop thinking in waterfall and start thinking in agile and sprints and harvest the learning and push them to the next sprint and capture the best practices. I, I'm sure this is sound familiar to a lot of lean folks on the call because this is the source. In fact, agile was uh, adopted uh, violently by uh, software engineers and software engineering management organizations worldwide um, to basically build the right software very close to customers. There's no reason why we should not do the same uh, in operation. And what happens is that the COE becomes the owner of this cadence that we just described. And they in fact becoming uh, very good at standardizing the process and actually solving for the anomaly that I've seen in implementing uh, lean and then digital lean and hopefully getting to the state that I like to call augmented lean, where you, you basically can, instead of like bolting down infrastructure and hardware and software, and then spending a lot when change happened to modify the code and redeploy and test and all that kind of stuff, but basically using tools that are in fact truly lean and focus on the people who do the work. And, and that leads to a more sustainable digital transformation. Um, it's, not, it's not without risks and there's, a, there's more learning to be done. And so I'll hand it off to Eric now and he can continue showing you uh, some of how we distilled uh, this uh, to practice even further. Thanks, Nathan. So the first thing here, when every so how do you practically do it? We covered the steps one through six. When you land on a site, and you say, okay, this is where I want to focus. This is where I'm going to build my greenhouse. 
the first thing we've done this, I don't know how many hundreds of times with, and our customers have done this. This is the methodology, methodology we teach. You come in and you talk to the, you, you learn the basics of the tool. You understand the problem, the pain points for the, for the operation. And then you come together in a room and you, and you just brainstorm. What are all the problems that you face today that you would like solved? And then you just simply score them. If that problem was solved, how impactful would it be to the business? And then knowing what you know about Tulip, how hard would it be to solve that problem? And we plot this to a simple quad chart. If it is high business impact, if it is easy to implement, that goes in the top right quadrant. This is your low-hanging fruit. Typically, this is where we see citizen development and COE take a shared approach to taking on these problems. It is likely they're being experienced elsewhere, and we should knock them out, and we should look for best practices there. Now, let's go to the bottom right quadrant. Maybe not so impactful to the business, but pretty easy to implement. You know what? COE probably doesn't need to have a real active role here. If this is a pain point for a specific engineer or operations professional, great, go nuts. You know, solve the problem, all good. You don't need to have a heavy hand in these types of implementations. If it is high business impact and very difficult to implement, this is typically where you see the COE take a more active role and provide a little bit greater depth uh, of, of, of talent as well when it comes to integrating with other systems and potentially bringing some folks with, you know, uh, potentially even a software background to help think through these issues. Now, one caution, if it is low business impact and hard to implement, we don't recommend taking that on, certainly not in your first wave. So, you know, proceed with caution if you find yourself in that environment. Now, Quickly here, I want to talk about how this verge, how this diverges from existing methodology for implementing these types of systems. Typically, what you would do is you would start with a list of paper requirements. You would say, okay, how, what are the problems we want to solve? How does the process work? You would define that process, bolt it down, as Natan said. Uh, then you would go ahead and build this system. You would build it perfectly, and you, it would take you some period of time. Uh, you know, build it perfectly. There's always bugs. And I tell you, the back end gets built first, the front end gets built last. And so that's always the part that they rush, which is a shame because that's what everyone's experience with that piece of, with that piece of software is going to be like forever. You turn it on, there's a big bang moment and somewhere between 12 to 24 months later, you theoretically are going to get value from this implementation. The approach that Natan and I are talking about is very different. You start with a very small pilot. You take on a couple of challenges. You, you stop. You incorporate the learnings from those challenges that you've solved and you apply them to the next set of problems that you're going to take on. And you repeat this process. And as you can see, value is created incrementally. You're de-risking the implementation as you go. And you're also accelerating development here by uh, you know, in this example, about a factor of four, you know, so you can, you can develop much more quickly when you're in a no code environment than if you have to worry about writing JavaScript for all of your software. Now, um, some things to keep in mind. We've covered a lot of ground here. Um, we want to start to wrap this up. The first is when you're taking these projects on, think in sprints. Harvest the learnings from previous uh, use cases that you, problems that you've solved and use cases that you've deployed and apply those to your next steps as you reevaluate the next uh, set of problems that you're going to be prioritizing. And then constantly be looking for uh, best practices. Every shop floor is different, but there, there are patterns. So when you found something like a 5S application or something like this, you know, these are good opportunities to disseminate those best practices to other sites and begin creating immediate value for them. Now, I want to switch gears here. We're going to go through a couple of quick examples. Uh, I'm going to uh, and then we're going to save a little bit of time here at the end for questions. So I'm going to go through these somewhat quickly. Uh, the first is a medical device manufacturer. These folks are uh, creating um, uh, a, a, a fairly complex piece of equipment. It's about the size of a mini refrigerator, um, and it is a life. It is a it is a critically dependent piece of equipment. So if you have this piece of equipment at home, with if it doesn't function or you're not using it, uh, it could quite literally, uh, you know, kill you. It's 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 mission critical, or in this case, it's critical to life. Um, these guys implemented Tulip. Uh, you know, it took them about three months. They fully embraced citizen development with proper controls, everything that we've been talking about today. Uh, they have about 90, a little over 90 applications that are being used across this greenfield facility. Um, you know, they're in full production, shipping this to market every day. Uh, and their whole EDHR system, which is what the FDA audits when they get inspected, exists in Tulip. And they, you know, they've gone through a number of inspections at this point in time. And the FDA is coming to them and saying, great, you know, we have everything we need. You've demonstrated a uh, very clear process, control over the process. And these are all being provided digitally uh, with the Tulip system. 
the second example I want to share with you is uh, the picture you saw earlier, DMG Mooring. Uh, so a global partner of ours. They're deployed today at over four, uh, at 14 sites. They have just north of 230 citizen developers across these 14 sites. And they are live today across uh, over 1,300 stations supporting 60, over 60 different use cases. So true at-scale digital transformation. And they're uh, about two years into their journey, uh, to be clear. So you can achieve this kind of scale. If you think back to that earlier scale where 18 months before you turn the lights on for the MES implementation, you know, in that same time frame, this is the kind of outcome you can and should expect. Now, uh, last but not least, Stanley Black & Decker, another global customer of ours. Uh, as of today, they have, uh, as of last, last week, they had 80 sites running, uh, running Tulip. Um, you know, this is being led by a, a center of excellence. Uh, the ROI numbers, I unfortunately can't share, but they're compelling. Um, and but that's but the, the impact, the business impact is one thing. What I really want to end on, though, is this story. So this is not a person I've ever met or talked to. Uh, I saw this post on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago. This is a, an engineer who's been at this company for a year and a half. Uh, and she posted a whole write-up on LinkedIn about this tool she found named Tulip and the problems she was facing as an engineer and how she was empowered by her team and by the Center of Excellence there at Stanley Black & Decker. And just a couple of things here. First, she walked in on day one and she says, like, look, the challenges here, they are many, but the opportunities are endless. You know, she built an application. She kept the operators as her primary customers. She got buy-in all along the way. Uh, and when she walked away, the, the full post I, could, I couldn't fit here, but I, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, you know, she implemented this, when, had 100% buy-in, and started driving uh, business impact immediately with this application, totally on her own. And, and she ends her post by saying, look, like, I have a vision. You know, I, I, I know the problems. This is my job. Uh, and this is, and I have a vision for what this can become within my, within my operation. This person's been in the workforce for a year and a half. And so my point here is that, you know, we're seeing this time and time and time again. Uh, and, and these are the people you have, and these are the people that we need to really double down on and invest in, because if we don't, they'll leave and they'll go do something else. Okay. So critical themes, and then we're going to be uh, handing it off for questions with our last five minutes. First, citizen development is here. Uh, embrace it. Second, Center of Excellence is uh, very powerful in helping uh, realize at scale adoption of this of this new paradigm shift, and it requires buy in from the operation. Uh, you know, you're not going to do this centrally administered without you know without without input from the shop floor. And then, last but not least, you know, solving real problems that the folks on the shop floor are facing. Uh, they're they're going to drive uh, incredible business outcomes in short form. So, with that. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hand it off to uh, questions we might have. Great. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Uh, so let's just jump right into the questions we have in right now. Uh, it looks like uh, Tulip, uh, does, does Tulip currently allow uh, permissions for levels for citizens developers? If it uh, give an up and coming employee the ability to work on an app, what kind of permissions do I need to hand over to them? Sure. Yeah, we have, um, Nathan, I'll answer this one quickly. We have a number of different permissions uh, on our user page. So you could view apps only, you can edit apps, you'd be approved to uh, publish those applications. We have a number of different permissions um, and, you know, happy to you know, walk through those uh, in more detail. There also, you'll find uh, definitions for these in our support documentation on support.tulip.co. Okay, great, great. Also, the, the, the old... Uh uh, idea that uh, there's the preventer of information technology in the company is uh, the, the IT department trying to block people from using anything new that might compromise the system. How, how do you get buy-in uh, across the entire organization to embrace citizen development culture? I think you you may you know there's there's the usual things you do to fit with an existing environment. This is just on the technical level, you know, support for Active Directories, SSO, you know, strict security protocols, good uh, uh, data resident residency, uh, the ability to support multiple clouds, um, uh, depending on customer needs. These are all helpful when you think on the infrastructure level, but uh, you know, on the, on the technical level. And, and the upscaling perspective, I think Eric mentioned the university and the, the ability to run programs quickly, both uh, front on, you know, frontally, like a tra train, trainer type of programs, but also as a self-serve uh, that help people uh, get, get into the tool fast. 
I think uh, you, people who are interested can also uh, kind of, you know, this is 2022 and you can just go on the website and click try now. And, and, and you know, uh, customers now are very, very smart and they do a lot of research and, and they want to touch the product and they don't want to talk to sales. What they want to do is figure out if this is a good thing for them. And, and for that, you know, being a self-serve tool that allows people to kind of experiment and try is, uh, I think, critical and, and allows to get the ball rolling. Great. So yeah, inertia is just a huge force in every business. Uh, what's your advice for introducing change when the people have been doing something this way for you know, decades in some cases, when, when the process hasn't changed in years? Yeah. Start small. I, exactly. start small. Not small. And start where they want change. You know, Don't come to them and say, hey, unlearn everything you've done, do it this way. Say, what are the problems that you're facing? And if you could solve any of them, what would you like solved? And then start the journey there. And Nathan, did you have anything to, to add to that? No, I think I think that that captured uh, pretty well. I mean, I'll just add to that: half the battle is change management. The technology is definitely here, um, and I, I don't think uh, if you try and project for the next decade, this is not about whether things will change. Things are changing. The question is how quickly you adapt to it and be ready for you know the next competitive wave. Right. Well, great presentation. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our speakers, uh, Nathan Linder and Eric Miranda, and our sponsor, Tool Interfaces. On behalf of Industry Week, have a productive remainder of your day. Thanks thank for you. having us. Pleasure.